everyone, Lord of Flames here, and we're back for another reaction video because I'm going to watch two videos for this one. Just it. Just it. Ah, just. That's it. Fuck. Anyways. Right now, it's going to be an SCP and a Minecraft animation video for it, Siren Head. And I had to record this twice because I forgot that I just turned off the freaking microphone because I was. Yesterday, I was playing Counter Strike because. I don't like uh, having my voice show up in the gameplay for that game because I don't care. So I had to gotta do it again because I forgot. So let's get on for this. Nice end show. The country of Russia and her people are no strangers to anomalies. Many of the most cataclysmic, enigmatic, and peculiar events in history seem to have occurred in and around the country. That footage. Whether this is just some strange coincidence or evidence of something more sinister remains to be seen. However, following the discovery of SCP-610, many within this clandestine foundation are starting to lean towards the latter. Discovery of this horrifying entity was entirely coincidental. In the rural areas surrounding Lake Baikal in southern Siberia, there was a spate of disappearances, all local farmers who were just vanishing mysteriously. Local police began an investigation, however, all who ventured into the region failed to return or even report in. Suspecting that something more significant was going down, the regional police were then ordered in, followed by an agent dispatched specially by the Russian government all infiltrated the site, and yet none returned. When a small military contingent were dispatched, they immediately withdrew from the compromised region and set up a containment perimeter, before contacting the Foundation. As you can see here on this map of the region provided to the Foundation team by the military contingent during their on-site briefing, the only affected areas appear to have been the Lena Nature Reserve and the Bargusin Nature Reserve on opposite sides of the Karenga River. Within these two reserves, multiple containment sites were established, labelled A through C, and the Foundation's investigation began. However, before we review the video footage, images, That's and observations gathered by the team right there, sent to scene. investigate the site, I think that it's best that I first brief you on the actual symptoms and mutations caused by SCP-610. Hopefully, the information that I'm about to share with you will provide further insight into why most investigations into this entity were done using drones and robots as opposed to humans. So, initially, SCP-610 behaves like a highly contagious skin disease, with symptoms including a rash, itching, and increased skin sensitivity. After three hours, however, this begins to worsen, forming blemishes that resemble heavy scar tissue on the chest and the arm areas, spreading to the legs and the back by the fourth hour. And by the fifth hour, these growths become so severe they consume the victim in its entirety. The time between these infection phases is, however, dependent upon the temperature of the area the infection is taking place. Full infection has been observed in as little as five minutes in warmer temperatures, yet colder temperatures seem to lead to a massively slowed rate of infection. Once these blemishes have consumed the entire body, the victim's life functions cease for roughly three minutes before restarting at two to three times the activity rate of a normal human. The fleshy growths that at this point have taken over the entire body then begin to move on their own accord and grow at a rapid rate, often growing three disgusting. or more extra arms but or I'm legs, if they will misshaping, the, elongating, and widening the head, and to, uh, splitting parts of the body SCP open to make room for new branches Steam, of flesh to grow. Where online, where At this point, all together, regular human features thing, are no longer visible, and know, are presumed to have been consumed or covered by flesh. It is currently unknown around. how long this stage of infection lasts, if it has an end point, or what the prerequisites are for reaching it, as not all victims appear to experience it. Once this stage of infection has been met, the victim, if it can even be regarded as the original victim at this point, can, under currently unknown conditions, root itself to the ground, allowing the extra flesh that it's grown to spread across all surrounding objects and consume them. This is done to create the perfect conditions to encourage the continued growth of both the other infected 
and the outbreak in general. However, it is worth noting that objects that are consumed by the disease cannot spread it like biologicals can. And speaking of its spread, like I already mentioned, SCP-610 is highly contagious and it seems the disease manipulates the behaviour of its host to exacerbate this. Those infected immediately seek out aid, almost as a part of their natural human survival instincts. This, as you can imagine, has resulted in many accidental infections in the past. However, it seems that once the scar tissue takes over the host, it alters its behaviour to encourage the spread of the disease, causing them to actively and aggressively attempt to infect anybody they either see or hear approach them. This extreme aggressiveness and its urge to spread the disease has earned SCP-610 the classification of Keta, indicating how difficult and expensive it is to contain, both consistently and reliably. It's the more only than known Keta. transmission vector of the it's disease more than a Keta, now, more dangerous than a is physical Keta. contact. Waterborne or aerial transmission methods more do like not hell. seem to be possible. The infection itself can take several days to manifest in its host, however there is an exception to this. It does appear to be faster when contact is made specifically with either exposed lung or liver tissue. Current protocol for dealing with an infected is as follows. Engage with small arms fire until the target is immobile and then destroy the body using either incendiary weapons or, if necessary, heavy munitions, but from a distance. Any biological who comes into contact with a 610 infected is to be considered expendable and immediately terminated and incinerated. Any biological who comes within 3 meters of an infected should withdraw, be isolated from their team and undergo rigorous remote medical examination, the outcome of which will dictate whether or not they should be terminated. Current containment protocol remains at a scorched earth level of policy thanks to the aggression of the infection. Despite a number of investigations into this specifically, many questions remain and that looks like all of which are still unanswered regarding the origin mine, of SCP-610. You know? However, those who study it within the various facilities it is stored colloquially refer to it as the flesh that hates. Good name. The flesh that hates. Okay, so now you understand the basics of this virus, how it transmits, how it spreads and how it infects and takes over a host. Let's return to the logs from the Foundation team, who were dispatched to its Ground Zero. The initial investigation was conducted remotely of Site A, a village, using a small land-based video feed drone named Herbie, controlled from the checkpoint on the edge of the quarantine zone, where the Foundation team, alongside local military, were based. A visual feed was also established via aerial reconnaissance with the use of thermal cameras. Initial observations showed clear signs that 610 had consumed most of the village, with roughly 79 infected still intact within. These infected showed clear signs of being in the advanced stages of the infection, with a variety of physical mutations. Herbie observed the exterior of the village for two hours, remaining stationary and undetected as it watched the infected roam throughout the village, seemingly exhibiting some sort of loose social structure, a degree of sentience if you will, unlike SCP-008, but unfortunately you lack the clearance level to be informed about 008. Yeah. After moving into a house in the village, some strange behaviour was observed. One infected, nicknamed Alpha, began violently beating a second infected, Beta, with extreme force. Beta appeared to be bedridden and reacted by flailing its arms in what was assumed to be a pain response. Once the beating had ceased, shortly after, Beta elicited loud piercing sounds and its chest exploded, releasing a cloud of spores that Alpha seemed to stand and bathe in, whereas another, possibly non-human infected, reacted to the spores by having a violent seizure. Alpha then proceeded to attach its facial tendrils to a number of dinner plates. The tendrils tore apart and separated, filling the plates with piles of sickly flesh which Ugh. other infected then entered the house and began consuming by shoving into any orifice they could find. On their mouths, their chests, mm. their backs, under their arms, Stop. new orifices Stop. that were never Stop there that. on their human forms. Stop. Alpha then left the house and was observed intermingling its facial tendrils with another infected who shared similar mutations. Whether this is some form of communication is currently unknown. 
Herbie then moved across the village to a general store, in the storeroom of which he saw an infected sitting atop a pile of uninfected bodies with its lower body fused to the pile of carcasses with biomass and its upper body in a wild state of flailing and seizure, with spore clouds emerging from its head in 10 second intervals. Upon venturing back out into the village, Herbie found the town well, surrounding which incredibly odd behaviour was noted. A number of infected stand immobile, all facing the well, but with their arms stretched out and touching one another, forming a perfect chain that seemed to surround the well itself, almost like a ritual. However, following these observations, Herbie was finally detected by an infected, and the unit was compromised. <laughs> So, following the loss of Herbie, on-site personnel then moved to investigate Site C, of which they did in a radically different manner. Instead of using drones, they used three Class D personnel who were infected, erecting ah, the quarantine that's perimeter, a video from Craig and subsequently put on ice Everybody to stave remember off that the guy? infection. We made that For those video. who might be unaware, Class D personnel are personnel who are intended to be expendable, typically taken from death row, convicted of violent crimes. The three infected individuals were sent into Site C with flares, gasoline, 9mm pistols, rations, and a video camera, and were ordered to document the infected. Researchers on site were particularly interested in the possibility of Site C being the ground zero of the outbreak, and so they ordered the Class Ds to pay particular attention to anything that could be considered an origin point of 610 and also, if detected, to engage the infected and try and destroy as many as possible while also doing as much damage as possible to infected objects and areas while always maintaining the video feed to try and provide data of 610 infected areas in a raid situation to allow a plan of eradication to be formed. Site C itself showed strong signs of aggressive infection, with strictures and even the ground consumed by the disease now layered in fleshy lumps, almost like the infected were terraforming. As the Class Ds got closer and closer to the site, the temperature began to shoot up, reaching as high as 32 degrees Celsius in Siberia. The site itself appeared to be encircled by a number of flesh pylons, as they were referred to. Small towers comprised of various body parts from two to four Look infected and fused Look together, with their orifices scattered faces, throughout acting almost as thing. heat vents, but where the heat was coming from is unknown. This led further to the theory that screens. Site C was indeed the ground zero, as 610's terraforming was nowhere near this complex at Site A. Upon entry into the site, DI2, which is the codename for the second Class D individual, began to seizure and quickly enter the scar tissue phase of infection, going from a normal human to entirely consumed by flesh in a mere 45 seconds. DI1, the first Class D, terminated DI2 and left his body where it was. The fleshy ground beneath it, however, then split open. Tendrils emerged and grabbed DI2's body and pulled it inside before sealing once again. Yeah. Based on this, it appears as if the flesh itself is sentient and requires sustenance of some kind. Further investigation You only killed the human host, but you didn't even kill the flesh Fearing the heat will cause them to shortly ate. suffer the same fate, DI-1 and DI-3 quickly proceeded into Site C, reaching the center of the village where another new entity was encountered. A large sphere floated above the well in the center of the village, comprised of human features both early in the stages of infection and also late, as well as nearby wildlife, all kind of mushed and possibly fused together to form an almost perfect ball, suspended or on angled support of 610 mine. biomass and the more bodies they collect, the more they get bigger and bigger and bigger to becoming seconds. a hive mine. This Reminds ball of biomass then began to float to the ground, of, of which was also infected by 610 like before, and begun kind of absorbing into it. The two Class Ds doused the ball in gasoline, lit a flare, and ignited it. But immediately after, a deafening sound described as both extremely explosive, yet also alive, like a large feral creature roaring, 
was heard from an undisclosed location and several explosions were reported at Site A. The ball of biomass at Site C then exploded, killing DI-3 and severely injuring DI-1, who shortly after was violently pulled into the centre of the town by an unknown entity. The final thing seen from their video cameras was a humanoid figure moving through the air, followed by the sound of an impact in the same direction, and the feed died. And thus, the investigation into Site C was then concluded, and aerial imaging from Site A was reviewed in light of the explosions that were detected there. It appears that upon destruction of the biomass ball at Site C, infected at Site A underwent seizures and convulsions. Immobile infected rapidly shriveled up and died, as did all of the flesh that had consumed objects and structures in the village. The few infected that survived entered a structure which moments later suffered a complete foundational collapse, revealing a sinkhole beneath. However, the size of said hole was only three men wide, nowhere near large enough to cause the entire building to collapse into the ground, huh. which suggested that there was something large in the sinkhole that actually pulled the building in. That's terrifying. Atmosphere samples sure were then taken, and it enough. appeared that Site A was clear of SCP-610 infection. So, research teams moved in and gathered a variety of samples. As they were gathering the samples, however, seismic activity was detected around the sinkhole, and once it concluded, a large cloud of spores emerged. Thankfully, all personnel on site were wearing adequate biohazard suits, so no infections occurred thanks to this. However, shortly after, a number of infected avian creatures began attacking the researchers, their heads splitting open and biting them, lifting them off the ground and seemingly trying to drop them into the sinkhole. Two personnel were lost in the hole and another was infected thanks to a suit breach and immediately terminated. Shortly after, a second seismic event then began, releasing yet another wave of spores from the sinkhole, after which a new SCP-610 entity emerged. A creature appearing as an engorged human head, roughly 20 times larger than normal, pressing itself out of the hole with no discernible body attached to it. As it emerged, seismic activity over tripled in intensity, hitting 7 on the Richter scale, before video and radio contact with the surviving researchers at Site A was lost. Very strangely, though, aerial imaging shows no sign of the research teams or their ever having been there. Their fates are currently unknown. You At this point, all dead, attempts not, to investigate and contain um, SCP-610 had degraded to a point where fail-safe Scorched Earth options were being seriously considered. However, before those plans were executed, those still at the checkpoint decided to send a drone armed with a 5.56 rifle into the sinkhole. Not a good weapon, you should As it use descended, a it was clear that the walls of this pit were lined with tracers of 610, and complete with a number of branching tunnels as deep down as 250 meters, which appeared to be the bottom of the sinkhole. As it moved through the tunnels, it detected an uninfected deer that was trapped and writhing in the grips of tendrils of 610 material, and suspended off the ground. Leaving the deer be, it ventured deeper into the tunnel, and the ground became lumpy. It turned out that these lumps were the infected villagers that fell into the sinkhole, beyond which was an underwater stream, likely connecting to the Karenga River. Fearing that the water itself may be contaminated, the researchers had the drone test a sample yeah, folks, of this water. Like in zombie thankfully, movies, thankfully, with some virus came back clean of any SCP-610 contamination. Is the drone bad, then ascended a the tunnel. Like, 100% hell bad, you know? Because if it consumes all the waters around the areas around you, the ocean, why not? The only water you can drink, you only go to a Walmart store or a shopping shop or something. So you can get a water bottle, a packs of them. Only that would work. 300 meters to the surface, emerging out near Site B another village on a windy mountainside. However, Site B appeared to be exhibiting a new 610 mutation. There were buildings constructed directly from the biomass, 
not just layered over like Site A and Site C. However, these biomass structures did appear to be deceased. However, no life whatsoever besides these now dead building structure things was detected at Site B. So, the drone descended back into the tunnel, upon which a deep roar sounded from its depths. The camera was quickly panned downwards and eventually the source of the roaring and the large tunnels emerged. An enormous human face stretched 20 times its proportions with no normal features, only those created by 610 material. Eye sockets, but no eyeballs. A mouth, but no teeth. Bullets that caused tiny entry wounds that sealed almost immediately, and seconds later, the drone was swallowed and the feed was lost. However, three hours later, it then returned. Visible, presumably, from inside this large creature resembling what? a stretched human head that it appeared was making the sinkholes appear to be structures and shambling entities within this creature walking around inside its stomach or whatever is inside it. Only a brief glimpse was available before the feed was permanently <laughs> severed. Following no. this terrifying nah. encounter, no. 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 somehow no. No. a manned exploration no. of the tunnels was approved. No. Three assault teams armed with rifles Bye. and flamethrowers along with two research teams descended into the tunnels. However, they didn't last long. Most were quickly picked off by never before encountered SCP-610 infected that appeared to be literally birthed from the infected matter on the walls. What? Those who did survive, however, managed to make it past the underground stream and reach Site B, where they encountered a new, red form of 610 infected, with biomass that rippled almost like waves on its skin made of clay, holding human captives in a dilapidated church, feeding them to regular infected, coating their bodies in biomass, Ew. before striking a gong which caused all of the regular infected to scurry to the church pews, almost like they were responding to a commander. After hiding in the darkness, the three remaining assault team members then attempted to flee the site to evac, but were picked off one by one. The first, by a tendril protruding from the ground. The second and third, by the red figure, now armed with a scythe. No members of the manned exploration team of the tunnels survived. No. The remaining files regarding SCP-610 remain classified. <laughs> and that is the horror of SCP-610. The flesh. Well, that's the end of that video. A very, very creepy entity with very clear similarities to other viruses, parasites, and diseases such as the G virus and of course, the ever iconic flood. Yeah. If you made it this far, then thank you very much. I really, really hope. Uh, anyways, folks, that's the end for that one video. We're going to the next one and ended it once and for all for this reaction video. But still, that's a terrifying creature that we never knew for SCP. It's probably the most terrifying creature than SCP-173. I think that was it. Cause there's no way. There's no way people will try to. Uh, Agree or say one sub free or other creatures from SCP are much terrifying than this thing. Not true. Not true. Because the way this thing is, it's terrifying because it could probably could consume other SCPs with their flesh or whatnot. Because it's called the flesh that hates. You know what I mean? Anyways, let's get on with another video, shall we? And this is by Cat Miner, one of the good, best YouTuber animators of all time. Give him credit. And this was mostly called the beginning, so this is mostly taking place before the event of that one of his previous. Siren Hand animation videos were, like the, the Creepypasta case stuff, that was mostly, uh, the audio was by Mr. Creepypasta.
and it seems they're looking for survivors. But you know what happens when you try to look for survivors, that Siren Head just got here before you. There's none. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Two hours later. Thirty minutes later. What's that, Puzzle Knight? Were you mistaken if it wasn't meant to be two hours, or it's meant to be thirty minutes? Maybe it was meant to be thirty minutes. Maybe it only takes two hours for these police officers to uh, drive to get to this town, and thirty minutes later, searching for survivors. That's sort of thing. I guess that works. So they found one survivor. He learns how to survive and he knows what's going on. Man, I hate in horror movies when there's had to be some dumb person who's always screams, yells a lot, Hello, and gets himself killed. So many people it have somehow been reminds me the, the quiet place. Occurrences of sound the quiet area. place, folks! And I thought you would be the perfect plumber to fix the siren since you haven't done much today. So, you only have to go to the village and fix the siren. Check out what the problem is supposed to be. You should be able to finish in no time. Come to my office for payment, and then you can go home. Look after yourself. I don't trust that boss. I would rather just quit the job and just go somewhere else, just working at 7-Eleven or something. Because why would someone just go to that abandoned place to fix a damn siren? We already got a siren. Siren head. But man, you got a voice actor in this? Good job. I'll give you a star for that. <laughs> Extra star or something. The man horror movies these days that make some dumb characters who decide to just get themselves killed so easily by going to a random place to fix things until they die. Hello, sir. Is damn thing working? Alright. <clears throat> so, people reported these weird noises around the area, and I don't think these sounds are coming from random speakers in the forest. I think the siren is the main problem here. It could be broken. I've been working here a very long time, and I've never encountered anything like this. So, boss, could you send someone to fix the damn siren? Eh. And thank you. No. 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 Not going to fix the siren. Because he'll get myself killed. Okay. He sent a plumber. But it already took him a day for him to arrive. According to the boss, the guy's name is Sam. Which reminds me of a good friend from college. Well, Simon. at least his name made my boring day a little bit better. <laughs> I hear the siren. Just had to make another audio log. When is this guy gonna arrive? It's already been two hours and I don't see anyone coming. The siren keeps getting louder. So I'm trying to do something about it, but nothing's working. Ah, shit, now I got a headache. Look, this guy needs to hurry up and get here, or else I'm gonna have to get What the fuck? Boy, no! 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 Fuck! Ah! 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 What the fuck? That was freak, freak, freak. That just happened. That just randomly happened. That's a good jump scare too, for a. Uh... For a hand just reaching out and then grab the guy and to meet him. Jeez. Besides, I don't know how is it possible for Simon Head to take all the voice over. Okay, I see a black figure right there with a red eyes. That's a villain, I guess. But anyways. Not sure how it's possible that Simon Head could take many voices. Like, 
if you look at the whole entire body look that has these wires so it looks at the map or whatever, how does it work? But anyways. Good one. Huh, maybe it reminds me of Slenderman Day Pages game, or The Arrivals. Where you always go to the forest gathering pages before Slenderman gets you. And I remember there's a Siren Head fan game called Siren Head Day Pages. Why would someone make something like that? Like, you would die so easily by Siren Head because Siren Head is a big tall creature! It will grab you so easily by, by 30 miles or something, and you die. Or you use his loud siren sounds, it'll just blow your brains out. So don't be that stupid for going out there to clip pages. We're getting our music, hmm. Huh? Wait, 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 wait. Wait. Hey guys, you know the dude who deals with the siren? I think he's gone nuts. That thing just won't stop. I'm gonna ask what's wrong with him. Huh. Interesting. You mean the guy from the phone call, or you mean that guy of that black figure with red eyes? I don't know. Maybe it's the phone guy, the boss man or whatnot, try to get people killed. He's alive. Somehow. Oh dear. Ah! Well, he's dead. Is that the end of the video? It looks like it is. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed, but I think I have a little bit here so who this black guy this red eyed guy is, which he's some person who used to be another type of worker until when he hear more things, like, when he uh, learned things about Siren Head, it seems like he tried to keep it stay from the town, away from everybody. So he's not some sort of bad guy. Somehow, well, of course, he get that person killed. But still. Or he's a person who is the phone call calling someone to get someone there to keep Siren Head stay there to eat. I don't know, but that was a good video too. Well folks, I hope you enjoyed this reaction videos. Leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more. This is the Lord of the Flames here, I will see you guys next time. Bye folks, have a wonderful day.